In a game of chess, each player receives two bishops. And they are placed on these squares as shown in the chessboard. So this will be the starting position of the bishops in a chess game. Notice that both these bishops are placed right next to the king and queen. And an easy way to remember this is that a bishop marries the king and the queen. And that is why on the chessboard they are placed right next to the king and queen. While both these bishops are same in the way they move and capture, the only difference is that that one bishop is always sitting on the dark squares and the other one is always sitting on the light squares. And that is why both these bishops have got different names. So the one that sits on the dark squares is called the dark squared bishop and the one that sits on the light squares is called the light squared bishop. So we have a dark squared bishop and a light squared bishop. Now let's understand how these bishops move in a game. So bishop always moves in diagonals. And since this bishop is sitting on a dark square, it will always move on the dark squared diagonals. Like this. Similarly, this bishop is sitting on the light square and therefore it can move on all the light square diagonals. To better understand the movement of this bishop, let's see an example. Let's say I want to get this bishop to this particular square. Then how will the bishop travel to this square? Well, first it can come to this square and then in the second turn it can come to this square. An alternative route for this bishop would be first to come on this square and then from this to this square. Let's see in practicality. Now let's say this bishop wants to travel to this square. Then it can first come on this square and then it can come on this square like this. Now let's understand the power of a bishop when it's placed on different squares of the chessboard. So when a bishop is placed on the corner of the board, it can control 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It can control 7 squares. When the same bishop is kept on the side of the board, it can control 7 squares. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the squares in the center of the board are these four squares. So if I keep this bishop on one of the centers of the board, then it can control a total of 13 squares. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So what does this mean? This means that when a bishop is placed in the center of the board, it can control more squares then if it is placed on the side of the board or on the corner of the board. So if you want to leverage the power of a bishop in a chess game, then you should place it somewhere near the center of the board where it can control more squares. And since this dark squared bishop would be able to travel anywhere on the 32 squares of the board because on a chess board, we have 32 dark squares and 32 light squares. And since this bishop would be able to control or rather travel anywhere on the 32 dark squares and the other bishop, which is the light square bishop, it would be able to control or travel anywhere in the remaining 32 squares. So when both these bishops work together on a chess board, they can form a great team because one bishop is able to travel on all the dark square diagonals on the board and the other bishop can travel on all the light squares on the board. Now, let's understand the point system. In a game of chess, each bishop is valued at 3 points. But if you are owning a pair of bishops in the game and your opponent has just one rook against your two bishops, then often these two bishops might prove to be more powerful than the opponent's rook because Firstly, they are more in points because 3 plus 3 would add up to 6 and if an opponent has a rook, that would be only 5 points. And secondly, if two minor pieces work in coordination, they can often prove stronger than one major piece on the chessboard. 
Now let's see how a bishop captures other pieces in the game. So if a bishop sees any opponent's piece on any of the diagonals that it controls, then that bishop has the option of capturing the opponent's piece. For example, here this light squared bishop can capture the opponent's bishop here on f3 like this. Then in the next move, it can capture this pawn. Then it can capture this rook. Then it can capture this knight here. And this way, this light squared bishop was able to capture all the opponent's pieces that came on its way while traveling on the light squared diagonals. Similarly, this dark squared bishop can capture any opponent's piece which stands on any of the diagonals that it controls. So for example, this bishop, since it controls these two diagonals and this opponent's queen is standing on the diagonal that the bishop controls, so this bishop can now capture this opponent's queen followed by this rook then this bishop over here, then the knight over here, and then finally this pawn. Please do like this video and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Also, do not forget to check out the amazing membership programs we have for you. And now comes the most interesting part of the video and that is question of the day. So my question is, if this particular bishop sitting over here wants to reach this square, then what is the least number of moves it would take to reach this square? Do give me your answers in the comments box and I shall see you in the next video. Bye!